Pastor Preuss has uh, been pastor at Faith Within Church, serving in the Wiley location since August of 2010. He is married to Becky, his wife, of seven years. And you're still married, right? Yes. <laughs> and praise God for that. And with whom he has six children, Hannah, Paul, John, Anastasia, Christian, and Isaiah. He graduated with his B.A. in Latin from the University of Minnesota in 2004. He then studied at Concordia Theological Seminary and obtained his um, MDiv degree in uh, 08. And he went on to obtain a master's in classics from the University of Kansas in 2010. He loves to write hymns and he writes to confuse his children by discussing politics with them. <laughs> what about theology too, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'd rather they not be confused by that. No, no, no. So Thank let's you. welcome Pastor Price. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, before I get to my manuscript, I'd like to point out uh, I disagree with Pastor Galler that uh, none of these topics is, or that all of these topics are comfortable. I think mine is very uncomfortable. Excuse me. Uh, but I but it may be that I made it more comfortable today. I'm not dealing with a lot of the controversial is issues surrounding birth control um, because it's, uh, it can be a very personal issue. Um, so with that, I'll just, I'll just get into my, my manuscript. Part one, unless the Lord builds the house. If there's one thing that we can all agree on, it might be that we need more babies. Babies are good. But sadly, this is not something that even Christians can all agree on today. And it really comes down to whether God makes babies or not. Don't ever take for granted even the simplest teachings of the Bible. I was teaching confirmation class to some very devout 7th and 8th graders a few years ago when I said that God makes babies. And they laughed at me. And they said, Pastor, we know where babies come from. It took me a good half hour to show them that it isn't proper to say that we make babies because God makes babies. Now, it's not the time to give a philosophy lecture, but it is a basic Epicurean materialist way of looking at things which only acknowledges the material cause to the exclusion of the efficient cause. In layman's terms, people think only of the means used to make it, but not the maker who made it. In the natural relations between men and women, God often makes the expression of their love result in a child. And this is a miraculous thing. It is the result of a law that God has rooted in nature that he at the same time calls a blessing. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1. It is so powerful a law that God even makes children outside of wedlock when a man and a woman do what married people are supposed to do. This is how God sustains the human race, how the promise of the gospel is kept alive, and how the world continues to be governed. Now, some people adopt the awful position which says, if God doesn't specifically condemn something in the Bible, then he has no opinion on the matter at all. And I don't know who invented this way of thinking. It might just be plain laziness. But maybe it's a distortion of what Lutherans have traditionally called adiaphora, or matters of indifference. In any case, it's spiritually foolish to think that stopping God's order of creation should be viewed as a morally neutral thing. It is true that we should not weave doctrines from our own deductions apart from an express word of God, since we may not ensnare pious consciences as to the doubt of their salvation. But the truth remains that God intends for children to be the result of a husband's and wife's love. The fact that there are difficult circumstances in which Christians question God's intention to give children doesn't give us the right to drop all moral consideration of the issue, and this has happened to us. There is an attitude among us, fostered from a very young age, that we are in control of everything. When I was a child, I remember people marveling that I came from a family of 11 boys and one girl. Christian men and women would ask me, even when I was only 8 or 9 or 10, and how many children do you want? I was always puzzled by this question, and I didn't know how to answer. I didn't know that I could make a baby at all. <laughs> My mom and dad taught me that God gave them the baby, and so I just figured that God would decide how many children I had. Well, now I'm 30 with six children, and I don't think I'm any less naive in the eyes of the world. 
nor am I any less confused by the questions I'm now asked as a father of six, the most notorious and offensive of which is, are you done yet? Christians aren't very consistent with their thinking. We all say every day, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, but as Luther says in his large catechism, we all pass over it, hear it, and say it. Yet we do not see or consider what the words teach us. For if we believe this teaching with the heart, we would also act according to it. We would not strut about proudly, act defiantly, and boast as though we had life, riches, power, honor, and such, I might add children, from ourselves. The world is drowned in blindness and abuses all the good things and God's gifts only for its own pride, greed, lust, and luxury. It never once thinks about God so as to thank him or, or acknowledge him as Lord and Creator. People don't want babies anymore. It's that simple. Thomas Malthus, who was a rationalist of the late 18th, early 19th centuries, is most famous for the theory that there aren't enough resources to sustain population growth. Malthus was actually a pastor who wanted to alleviate the plight of the poor, and he thought this could best be done by providing more resources to them. He then assumed that a lack of resources was due to overpopulation and concluded that the population needed to be limited. Since his An Essay on the Principle of Population was first published in 1798, many thinkers have followed his logic to form their own views on society, most notably Charles Darwin claimed to have come upon his theory of the survival of the fittest while reading this essay. Pretty fascinating. Malthus thought that the population might be tempered in a rational Christian way. Population could be controlled if men and women remained single until a man could suitably support a family. The problem with this, of course, would be the passions of the men and women, which would require much diligence in restraining. Good luck with that. From the obvious disgust that every Christian should have for Malthus's rationalism, that he blames famine and poverty on God's creative work through procreation and not on human greed and selfishness, from this we can discern also the complete lack of faith Reverend Malthus displayed by laying such a great emphasis on financial stability as a prerequisite for marriage. While I certainly support the idea of a man learning a trade and being able to support his family, whoever does not support his own is worse than an infidel, as it says in 1 Timothy 5, the question of how much money is required to raise a family is completely relative to a man's own tastes and desires, a point that Malthus himself almost concedes. God does not will that a man support his family without working. That is the meaning of God's command to Adam after the fall. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. But Solomon writes in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. We are to work for a living because God commands men to do this, but we are not to think that we deserve a living from God because of our labor. We look to God for our support, not to, to God for our support, not to our labor. This is a very important point. Luther writes commenting on this verse. Solomon here wishes to sanction work, but to reject worry and covetousness. He does not say, the Lord builds the house so no one needs to labor at it. He does say, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. This is as if he were to say, man must work, but that work is in vain if it stands alone and thinks it can sustain itself. Work cannot do this. God must do it. Therefore, work in such a manner that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is in vain when you worry and rely on your own efforts to sustain yourself. It behooves you to labor but your sustenance and the maintenance of your household belong to God alone. Therefore, you must keep these two things far apart, to labor and to maintain a household or to sustain. Keep them as far apart from one another as heaven and earth or God and man. Now, no doubt these words of Luther would have driven a practical statistician like Malthus crazy, as well they should. We are speaking here of faith versus unbelief, trust versus idolatry, godliness with contentment, against covetousness with greed. It is a simple matter of what we Lutherans confess in the meaning to the first article of the Apostles' Creed. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. Man by nature now thinks that he has everything because he deserves it. This is part of the infection given by the devil to our father, Adam. We think we are like God, knowing good and evil. And this gives us an entitlement complex, so to speak, 
which our reason justifies. We eat bread from our sweat, and we learn somehow that if we sweat some more, then we will get more bread, or sweeter bread at least. We then deduce that we get our bread from our labor. This is unassailable logic, of course, but of course, God must tear it down. There is nothing that we have that we did not receive, 1 Corinthians 4. God tells us to work. Yes, he says, if any would not work, neither should he eat, 2 Thessalonians 3. But we are not thereby to conclude that it is our work that actually gives us food. Neither are we to assume that our work builds our house and provides for our children. The Lord builds the house, or we build in vain. The Lord provides for our children, or we provide in vain. Thinking that our good hard work gives us life through sustenance is idolatry. And it is idolatry of the worst sort because it looks pious. Hard workers are above those freeloaders who only want to sit around and do nothing, reaping where they have not sowed, robbing their fellow man of their sweat and blood, as happens daily in the welfare state. But really, trusting in our own hard work is denying God his prerogative as our maker and preserver. It is not man, but God, who opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing, as Israel sings. So also, it is not man, but God, who opens and closes the womb, as Jacob confesses to Rachel. A man works, and God feeds him thereby, but a man should not say that he gave himself the food. God give, gave him the food. He prays and thanks God for it and sanctifies the food thereby. A husband and wife enjoy the marriage bed, but they should not say that they gave themselves children. That is, again, idolatry, because it fails to recognize God as the giver and author of life and gives glory and credit to the creature rather than the creator. God gave him the child. This is the meaning of Psalm 127. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Human, gets, human reason gets very frustrated at this point. Of course it's up to us, she screams. You can talk all you want about God doing it, but the fact is we all know where babies come from. Well, actually, no, most people today don't realize that babies come from God. They think they come from a purely material and physical process, giving no thought to the spiritual dimensions of what they are mechanically doing when they do what God gave a husband and wife to do. And that is precisely the problem today. There is no longer any consideration of the creator in our contemplation of the created. This leads to the loss of human dignity. Without God, man has no dignity, since he was created in the image of God. Or it might be more accurate to say that man loses any understanding of the dignity of God's creation. What God made is good, regardless of how our sin has infected it, but man sees less and less of the good the farther he gets away from understanding God's will in creation. You all following me right now? Part two, from idolatry to sexual depravity. If you want to understand the general trends of today's sexual mores, why so many men of our culture are generally apathetic weaklings who are either bossed around by their wives or avoid having them altogether, I kind of, it just felt too good to write that. I'm sorry, I, I had to write that. What? I figured I'm among, among Lutherans, so. Why so many women of our culture do not guard their wombs from fornication as diligently as in times past, why so many children of our culture have lost all fear and reverence of their fathers, and why they care so little about what is true and so much about what makes them immediately happy, you need to understand what most people are worshiping. God has given our culture over to these behaviors because of their greater sin of idolatry. This is real wrath and punishment from God against all evildoers, as described in Romans 1. God punishes sin with sin. It is idolatry that leads us to worship and serve the creature over the creator. Idolatry ultimately leads to a loss of the dignity of our bodies and of creation. For example, the Israelites in the wilderness were tempted to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Adultery and idolatry are often linked together in the scripture, but nowhere are idolatry and sexual immorality more shockingly associated than in Paul's indictment of heathen behavior in Romans 1. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their, lusts of their hearts 
to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God punishes sin with sin. Idolatry is the worst sin, and all sins are encapsulated in it. All sins are against the first commandment. Covetousness is, as Paul teaches, idolatry. You can expect, then, that when we are given to covetousness, then we will also be given to sexual immorality, and that marriage will decay. Where does this idolatry come from, this greed? Well, some people like to point to the Industrial Revolution, and that may help us understand the form of the greed we are encountering today. The Industrial Revolution began a long process of the end of the domestic economy, the economy in the home. Man relied on his labor being artificially valued by the profiteering practices of his employer. Some call this simple urbanization, but it never happened on such a scale as it happened 200 years ago, right during the time that Malthus was writing. This certainly provided the framework for the present circumstances, but with, the issue, with regard to the issue of birth control, the progression is quite simple, and I'm speaking in general terms, not about anybody in, uh, specifically. Man desires money, man desires woman. Man desires to keep both money and woman. Man reasons that children will allow him only to keep woman and not the money. Man chooses to keep money over children so that he can have money and woman at the same time. When this happens over the course of several generations, the consequences can't be hidden. You don't need the Industrial Revolution for this to happen, although increased technology has pushed women more and more out of the home to participate in the economy. When men choose women over children, they are believing that their money is more important than God's act of procreation. When they do this, they are displaying two things. First, they show a lack of trust in God. In this lack of trust, there is also a second, which is idolatry. In, the second, in this lack of trust, there is also a second something hidden, which people do not see, especially not insensitive men. There is an attitude towards the role of women in their lives that is fostered by idolatry and worship of mammon. The sweat of man's brow is now used more for himself than for others. He chooses to sweat and provide more for himself than for the children who come from his union to his wife. He may be able to buy a lot for his wife, but he won't be investing in his wife's natural labor, which is bearing and raising children at home. Now he has money and a woman who is still sexual, but without the purpose of procreation. His money is invested more and more in activities that do not per support the raising of children, but rather the gratification of his own selfish desires. When men stop looking at women primarily as mothers, the meaning of woman changes dramatically. They are still sexual beings, but their sex is not defined primarily according to its glory and power, namely the power to bear and nurture children and the glory of ruling next to her husband over a family. That's having dominion over the earth. Rather, the female sex is viewed for the pleasure she brings to the man. She is permanently objectified. Feminists claim that birth control would liberate woman, but in reality, it has only given her Adam's curse as well as Eve's, while at the same time depriving her of her honorable place among Eve, Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth, Mary, and all her mothers in the faith. As seen in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a natural progression from greed to sexual depravity. When men choose money over children, they choose money over women as well. When they worship the creature, the creature loses sight of the creator and thus the dignity of creation. This is why the more children are despised in a culture, the more women are objectified for their sexual beauty apart from children. The more decadent and rich a society, the more Venus is worshipped. It's just simply true. Look at Corinth, modern day Corinth. Having a Bible class on it at Wiley. When Venus is worshipped, children are sacrificed to Moloch as Margaret Sanger's advocacy of birth control inevitably led to. Abortion is the best birth control. Most of the demands of feminism simply reflect women following the men in their idolatry and worship of the, creator over, the cre creation over the creator, which is why I don't really like blaming things on feminism, because it really all starts with a man. The result, and I was going to put a part of my paper, was that who sinned first, Adam or Eve? Well, it was Adam, because he didn't take care of his wife. The results are what we see around us every day, the progression from idolatry to sexual immorality to death, as Rudyard Kipling's poem, The Gods of the Copybook Headings, which I recited in full at the pastor's brew crew last spring, prophesied nearly 100 years ago in these 
concise lines. On the first feminine sandstones, they promised the fuller life that started by loving your neighbor, but ended by loving his wife. Till our women had no more children, and the men lost reason and faith, and the gods of the copybook headings said, the wages of sin is death. Truly prophetic verses. God gave man and woman the desire for each other. This is a good thing, and that shows that every, that every, and it shows that every Christian who has these desires has the right and even the responsibility to find a spouse. That's what our Lutheran confessions teach. Perhaps you've heard a modern adherent to Darwin speak of how one's sexual desires are simply natural and that to follow them is as moral as following the desire to eat or to sleep. Y'all, y'all heard that? This is, there is always a hint of truth in lies. It is natural to eat and to drink. It's not natural to gorge oneself and to become obese or drunken. In fact, that is a sin. It is natural to sleep. It's not natural to sit around all day doing nothing and sleep more than you need to. In fact, that is also a sin called sloth, and those who do this are called teenagers. <laughs> I mean, sluggards, yeah. You all know what I'm talking about. So also, it is natural for one to have relations within the bands of matrimony, but it is not natural to have relations outside the bands of matrimony. Nature teaches this. If a man were to be left alone, if a woman were to be left alone without her husband to give birth and take care of her children, she would, it would be nearly impossible for her to survive with a child. The man is stronger by nature and more suited to work for her, to protect her, while her body is made to bear and nourish a newborn child. Nature teaches that sex should be within marriage because of children. But nature doesn't teach us that sex should be within marriage apart from children. Once you take children away, nature's teaching about what sex is for is muted. We need to understand this. When we habitually separate God's intent to create life from our union with our spouse, we are removing the wholesome evidence of our one flesh union. And this came to me as I was watching Becky hold Isaiah, who's our youngest, and he made this face, this kind of aw shucks face, like, which I, every one of my kids has made, every single one of them, and neither Becky nor I, I think, makes this face. But I saw there's a mixture of both of us in them, in every one of our six children. And each one of those is proof of what God said, you are one flesh. Proof that God made us one flesh. And proof of the purpose of the sexual union. Children are the wholesome and salutary evidence of marriage. Marriage exists without children. This is true. There is nothing lacking in the one flesh union of a man and his wife if God does not grant them children. There is nothing lacking. And, and it is perfectly good. And yet children are the normal evidence of the one flesh union. When you remove this evidence of the sexual union, it will ultimately be replaced with whatever was chosen instead of children, which is the worship of the creation over the creator. Having children curbs a man's sinful nature. He must give up his own desires for the sake of his children. The failures of large families are harder to hide. I know I grew up in one. It is humbling for a man not to be able to give his children what other men can give their children. It is humbling for a man to be denied the pleasures he enjoyed in life before his children came. It's humbling to have to rely on the charity of others. It is humbling, but it gives a man dignity that his labor could not otherwise give him. When a man is working only to live for himself, there is nothing dignified about that, despite what the Republican Party might teach you, not that I'm a Democrat. This is why a single Christian man or woman who works alone emulates what a father or mother does by giving his goods in service of others. This gives the work dignity, serving others does. When men stop being fathers and sacrificing their own pleasures for their children, our culture has fewer and fewer role models to emulate who do sacrifice for their children. But one person you can guarantee will nearly always exhibit self-sacrifice is the mother. Even if the father leaves, the mother remains to sacrifice for the baby. When the man fails, the woman steps up and now she leads, like Deborah did in the Old Testament. She becomes the role model for all virtue in a culture where man has chosen to gratify his own desires rather than provide for the needs of his own. Why don't men sing in our culture? Because men aren't the leaders in the homes anymore. They aren't, and that means they're not the leaders in the culture anymore. As Pastor Welmer pointed out, the, the, the three estates, the domestic estate or the state of the home, whatever happens there affects what happens in the state or in the culture at large. 
So men, when men stopped being the leaders in the homes, they stopped being the leaders in the culture, and then they gave up that they gave that up when they said they didn't want women who were mothers and children who would listen to the songs they sang. Why do girls dress so inappropriately today? Because their fathers let them. Why? Because they want their wives to dress that way. Or they are intimidated by women who are simply trying to please the man. Either way, men, men stop being needed when they stop desiring children. When men aren't needed, they sulk away to their proverbial man caves and too often imitate the complaining fathers of every television sitcom in the last 20 years. When we stop desiring babies, we lose so much that we don't realize. We stop desiring God's creative work among us. The more we trust in how we build, the less we see the builder. The less we see the builder, the vainer our lives become on this earth as we seek to construct meaning apart from how God has decided it. Part three, the baby Jesus, God's antidote to vanity. God knew that life in a fallen world would be vanity. He subjected all creation to futility when he told Adam that the earth was cursed because of him. But man was given work to do so that he might have hope during his days of his vanity. But his hope doesn't come from his work. His hope comes from the promise of children. He must listen to his woman scream in pangs of childbirth before he has hope. Woman was given increased pains in childbirth, and she was told that her husband would rule over her. She must look to her sweating man as she waits in hope. Man sweats, woman screams, both hope. For what? When God created the original family, it consisted of one man and one woman. All authority on earth was given to the man and the woman. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 1. God gives man authority over his creation after he blesses them with the command to be fruitful and multiply. It follows that unless man, male and female, is fruitful, he cannot fill the earth and subdue it. Unless man is fruitful, his authority is not properly exercised. And his authority has never been properly exercised in this fallen world. Before the first man and woman could be fruitful and multiply, the serpent deceived the woman and led man into sin. Death awaited them. Their entire life was now worthless. Creation was marred in ways beyond our understanding. But God had mercy on his fallen creation. Man died spiritually in the Garden of Eden, but God soon brought them to life again by means of his living word, the first gospel. God said to the devil in Genesis 3.15 in the presence of the man and the woman, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So Christ will bruise the serpent's head. Man had never been fruitful, but it was the promise of a child, the seed of the woman, which made life not utterly futile. This child was not to come from man, but it was to be woman's seed. Normally you don't have a woman's seed, you have the fruit of the womb. You have man's seed, but God says woman's seed. The first, think about this, the first mention of a child in Holy Scripture is of Jesus Christ, the son of a virgin, and this first child is not the result of a husband's and wife's desire for one another. He is not the result of procreation, but he gives all procreated life hope. It is Christ alone who can restore creation, since he alone can take away from us the sin that infects us, the crown of God's creation. But what God created was still good, it was only that God subjected the creation to futility after the fall, as Paul says in Romans 8. And Paul here is really commenting on God's curse to Adam. Cursed is the ground because, because of you. For creation, now listen to the birth language in this. For the creation waits for, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. When was creation subjected to futility? When Adam fell. But God subjected creation to futility in hope. Adam had this hope when he named his wife Eve after he heard the promise. Eve, chava, means life in Hebrew. 
Eve had this hope as she kept in her heart the promise of a woman's seed. She naturally assumed that she was the woman and that it was to be her seed that would crush the devil's head. And so Eve, whose name means life, in her first childbirth said, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Cain, Cain, comes from a Hebrew word meaning to get or to receive. This, she, she thought, Eve thought, that she had received the Messiah, the seed of the woman that God spoke of. But Cain had a twin brother. And you can tell this because it doesn't say that she, he knew her again and that she conceived again. Cain and Abel were twins. Cain had a twin brother. Abel came out next, showing that she had prematurely judged Cain to be the Messiah, the one to crush the serpent's head. And so she named him Abel, Havel, which means in Hebrew, vanity or futility. Eve had waited for nine months in eager longing for the Son of God. She had grown for him to be revealed. When he wasn't, she groaned out a word that now defines man exi man's existence in this short life of labor, vanity. And then Cain proved Eve's words even more wrong as the first result of the love between a man and a woman became murder. And so this is what we all face today when we see our children. We give birth to sinners, and we ourselves are sinners. It is a vicious cycle of idolatry and chasing after vanity and death, as Solomon describes life in Ecclesiastes. But there is hope for children, and there is hope in children, and we need to remember that. What is man that God is mindful of him? In order to understand any meaning or purpose in this life, we must look to Christ. And this is the reason is that people say, I don't want to bring children into such an evil world. I actually, I've heard this from pastors say this. But Christ proves this wrong. And that's my point in, in, in the next page or so. In order to understand the true value of children, we must look to Christ. The world will only value children as long as and to the extent that they give her joy and pleasure. So when children were economically advantaged, an advantage, people had more children. When they're not, people decide not to have them. On what basis do we as Christians think differently than this covetous world? Christ is the hope of all creation. Isaiah 8 describes him as the son of man who was deprived of God for a little while, or made lower than the angels, and then crowned with glory and honor. Then all things were put under his feet that were supposed to be under Adam and Eve's feet, but weren't because of the fall. He is the seed of the woman. He ends idolatry by worshiping only God and by loving his neighbor as himself. As the hymn goes, an idol form shall perish and error shall decay, and Christ shall wield his scepter, our Lord and God, for a... At least that's the way it was in the old hymnal. He curses the devil with the blood of his bruised heel. He binds himself to our flesh and blood in the womb of the virgin. By doing this, he shows that the curse and the fall have not prevented bearing children from being a blessing. If God chooses the womb in a sinful world, then the womb is blessed, and so is its fruit. Christ answers the woman's curse by sanctifying her work. He was served by a woman. And he received the service of Mary's womb, Mary's breast, Mary's sleepless nights, Mary's tears and prayers. It is certainly not without Christ in mind that Paul says to Timothy, Women shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. It is not having babies that saves woman. Childbearing is the natural vocation of a woman to serve God in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. Jesus' birth teaches this. All generations will call Mary blessed, who said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. So also Christian women can be confident that they are God's own chosen vessels to bring forth life into this world. A generation that doesn't call Mary blessed is a generation that despises babies and the honor that, that women have in raising them. By the way, Paul McCartney's, came here. Paul McCartney's song, Mother Mary Comes to Me, Speaking Words of Wisdom, Let It Be. What a wrong interpretation of, Jesus, of Mary's words. Let it be to me according to your word, not let it be to me, let, let it just be. Because he was actually talking about the idolatry of his fellow Beatles members, but why am I talking about this? <laughs> Let's get back. Christ answers the man's curse by sanctifying his work. He shows man what his work is for. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here is two pertinent, I, I thought I... Wouldn't need to quote it because I let everybody else will quote it. But Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to sanctify and cleanse her as, the, uh, uh, as his bride uh, from Ephesians 5. As Luther taught, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord subject to none and at the same time a, uh, the servant of all subject to everyone. Christ's own life of labor shows that work is honorable when it is done in service to the neighbor. 
A Christian man can do his work knowing that his labor pleases God, since through his work, God provides for his wife and children. That goes back to the original point. And the work that Christians have as fathers and mothers is not limited to this old creation, but by virtue of the birth of Christ, his incarnation, and vicarious suffering, death, and resurrection for us, the work of a father and mother is eternal, as they bring their children to the God who made them, provided for them, and brought them to faith through his vessels of mercy, the father and mother. People view children as a curse and not as a blessing. And so they seek not to be fruitful, but ultimately they curse themselves into further idolatry and sexual depravity, maybe even murder. And while nature itself can teach us the benefits having children and raising them brings to men and women, Christ alone shows how the curse of man's and woman's existence is turned into an eternal blessing for us. I have some closing remarks. In closing, I have just a few points to make. We, we need to re-examine our use of birth control. It is not a morally neutral matter. Pastors in the past have been negligent about preaching about this for a few reasons. First, because modern Protestant theology has asserted that the Bible says nothing about the, about the matter. This position is being seen more and more for the naive, naivety it displays. The Bible asserts creation and blesses the sexual union of a man and a woman with the command to be fruitful and multiply. Asserting that, a, that Christians can ignore this has done irreparable damage to our families and our homes and to society in general and thus to the pro proclamation of the gospel in this land. We are left with the wholesale use of birth control by Christians without any moral consideration whatsoever. I have even seen pastors recommend to newlywed couples to avoid having children until they become more financially stable, and that's wrong. We need to trust in God as our maker and preserver. Remember Lot's wife. She loved her life in Sodom, and she didn't escape the judgment. We are strangers and pilgrims on this earth, as were all our fathers and mothers. We shouldn't be afraid to look a bit strange by having more children. This requires us to be willing to humble ourselves, to receive charity, as well as to give it to those in need, whenever we hear about them. If we spend more money on entertaining ourselves than on feeding the poor, then we must confess that greed has set its roots deeply in our hearts. We should never assume we know why people have or have not kids. God opens and closes the womb. We should pray more for pregnant women, for mothers with small children, and for barren women, giving thanks for their faithful service. Women today are taught to find glory outside the home. The church needs to encourage barren women while at the same time maintaining the honor of motherhood. We should also pray for men, that they be faithful to their marriage vows and teach their children God's word. They need to be ready to teach their children at a young age so that, so that their children grow up looking to them for guidance from God's word. Too much effort is spent on youth programs where the children are usually already set in their ways. Churches spend thousands of dollars trying to keep self-absorbed teenagers interested in God via entertainment that models an ungodly culture. We give them more of the kind of attention that makes them the brats they are. They don't need the more feminine smother you with love attention. They esteem themselves too much and for all the wrong reasons. They need manly, thus set the Lord attention, and they need it when they're young. We need to start early. Bring the family altar into our members' homes when the children are little. Only God's word can remedy the present lack of fatherhood. There is no worldly incentive to promote fatherhood's advantages right now. According to some studies, prescription birth control has, re has risks of being abortifacient that is causing the deaths of children conceived while using this medication. Christians should know this and act accordingly. I have a couple of links for you to, to, to look up. One thing I wish I could end immediately, however, is joking around about how we're done having kids because birth is so painful, or they're so expensive, or I told my husband that was the last one, or I told my wife I couldn't handle anymore. This kind of talk is unbecoming of Christians and frankly makes us look like a bunch of ungrateful heathen who would speak of God's gifts of children in such crass and materialistic terms. Children hurt. They hurt your wallet. They make you sweat more, they make you sick. It happened to me last week. <laughs> they hurt your body. They give you pain. And then they hurt your heart. They give you sorrow. Children are a burden on us. And God calls them a blessing. Our sinful minds will never quite figure out why. It's more than the rush my heart felt when I first saw each one born. It's more than the spontaneous joy that comes when they smile at me. 
It's more than pride I feel when they accomplish something good, and it's more than the pain and the sorrow and sweat that come with the day's labor labored for them and my wife. Children are a blessing because God became a child to bless us. It is a mystery we will weep over and laugh over and never understand until this creation stops groaning in birth pangs and reveals the freedom and glory of the children of God. In the meantime, God grant us humility and courage to live our lives serving one another in the grace of God. Our Heavenly Father forgives us all our sins so graciously for the sake of Christ his Son. He will be with us in every trial we meet, especially as he promises to bless us with children. Thank you.